so let's start. Okay, so I'm gonna um, introduce myself and the rest of the USL presenters are gonna um, introduce themselves, okay? And then we'll get into it, okay? So I am Jackson Murphy, my pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm a member of USL. And I will pass it off to Annie. Hi, my name is Annie Philp. Um, I am also a member of USL. I use she, her pronouns. And um, I'm also a member of Social Justice Club and would be Climate Strike. And I'll pass it off to Abigail. Hi, my name is Abigail. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am a part of USL. And I'll pass it off to Maddie. Hi, um, I'm Maddie Raisco. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am a member of USL. And I will pass it to Tevrin. Um, hi, my name is Tevrin. I use they, them pronouns, and I am a member of USL. Um, and I'll pass it off to Eva. Hi, I'm Eva. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a member of USL. And I'll pass it off to Derek. Hi, I'm Derek Koshiko. I use he, him pronouns. And um, I'm with USL Solidarity Over Supremacy and E3 Washington. Um, not sure who hasn't gone yet. So could you use some help? Okay. I believe that is everyone. Yeah, I yeah. think that's true of everyone here. Um, and just noting that uh, I do see a few other students um, or Maggie and Trevor, it looks like joining who are also from USL. Um, so you all are welcome to answer questions in the Q&A later or participate um, as you see fit. Okay. So if you know that's right. Okay. And uh, just some Zoom protocol. Okay, so we'd like everyone to have their camera on if that's at all possible for you and your mic muted just because with this many people um, on Zoom, it might be distracting to have your background noise. Um, and we'd like everyone to put their name and their pronouns in their Zoom name, please. Okay, and there's two ways to do that if you don't know how. You can click the participants and go to your name and click more and then the rename button just like the picture shows. And also um, you can hit the three dots by your video if it is on, or I guess it's if, if it's not, and you go down to the rename button and also type it in there, okay? So if everyone could do that, that would be great. And the protocol, if there's a disturbance, we just would like everyone to turn their cameras off just for your own safety and we will try to get the disturbance out as fast as possible. If it is too triggering for you and you need to leave the meeting, that is totally okay. And we will reconnect with you after the meeting via email. So yeah, thank you everyone for being here again. Yeah. Okay. Now you can change the slide and I'm gonna go into a brief uh, summary of who we are, just for those of you who are newer to USL um, or don't know us yet. So we are USL, um, we're a student-led and student-organized or organization, and we were founded almost two years ago uh, by two students from South Ruby High School. And we started off uh, protesting um, two local banks, Chase and Wells Fargo, who have a lot of investments in the fossil fuel industry, and um, yeah. And that led into the Letters for the Banks campaign where we wrote those banks and other banks um, about their climate policies and ranked them. And yeah, and another action that we've taken is um, our Transforming Education campaign, which was kicked off by our webinar series last summer. And in result of that campaign that is still ongoing, we've gotten an ethnic studies class and an environmental science class that will start at this house high school um, this fall. And um, at the end of last school year, we also organized a counter protest that got 360 people, 160 of which were students to defend those changes that we've made to our education. Um, and we also, another uh, successful or at least successful part of a campaign is we got a climate declaration passed by the city of Langley. 
which we are enacting or helping enact. So yeah, those are just some of our accomplishments and kind of a short overview of USL. Um, yeah. So next slide. Okay, so these are our future webinars. So this is the first webinar of a series of three. This is the patriarchy webinar series. And this one is the intro to the introduction to patriarchy. And the next one next Monday will be rape culture and dress code. And then on August 9th, which is also Monday, is misogyny and, to and toxic masculinity. And after that, these have yet to be scheduled are the discrimination webinar series and then the climate crisis webinar series. So we hope all of you will be able to tune in for those. Um, and yeah. And you can go to the next one. Okay. So why are we doing this series? We're doing these series for a lot of reasons, but these are some of them. We're doing this webinar series to spread awareness about what the patriarchy is and how it affects our society and culture every day. And where we hope that these webinars will help our community to be aware of the patriarchy and ways to dismantle it. Um, and I hope that everyone who comes here today leaves with a new perspective on the world that you can use to better your community. Um, so yeah. And I'm gonna open it up just for a minute for any USL students that would like to share other ways or other reasons why they are doing this series? Um, I'll just share as well. And thank you, Jackson. That was a great overview um, that the reason we're doing this webinar and that we think it's so crucial to um, bettering our activism and uh, our community's um, commitment to equity is that you cannot make lasting and effective change um, within a system that continues to perpetuate oppression. So by dismantling that system, you're able to create um, a new way of going about business, about uh, a new way of enacting policy that um, is equitable and that uh, benefits everyone, is um, including everyone in that decision-making process as well. And if there are any other students who would like to add, please feel free to. Okay. Here we go. So I am going to stop the share for a second here. Is having some difficulties with the presentation, but we should be good now. Okay, um, before we get started with the webinar, I would, go, I would like to go over a trigger warning. Um, with this patriarchy webinar, we will be going over topics that may be triggering to individuals who um, have been experienced uh, the same systems that we are talking about um, and who have been very negatively affected by those systems. Um, please feel free to turn off your camera or leave the meeting is, if that is what you wish to do. Um, also, if you need to contact us after the meeting, we are always happy to meet with individuals um, and we're always reachable via email as well. Um, on the other hand, you know, this is a, a topic that um, does come with a little bit of discomfort for some, and I would like to invite you all to welcome that discomfort and um, to really look into dismantling um, the patriarchy with us and what that actually means um, and to put away any biases that you may have come here with that um, we all inherently have. Okay. So to start us off here, first of all, welcome to the first um, webinar in our patriarchy webinar series. Uh, we would like to start off with a reflection. So what comes to mind when people say patriarchy? What do you think of, who do you think it affects? Um, and how do you think that impacts your daily life as well? What are the ways in which you see it uh, throughout society? We are going to go ahead and give this two minutes. Um, please feel free to brainstorm, write something down on a piece of paper. Uh, we will be welcoming comments in the chat, but that will be at the exact same time. So um, please, if you're wanting to say something in the chat, go ahead and type it up, but wait to enter it until everyone um, has submitted and the two minutes are up. I'm going to go ahead and start the timer now. 
Um, so please feel free to think about this. Okay, I'm going to welcome everyone back to the space. Um, if you did choose to enter something into the chat, you may press enter now and um, let everyone else see your comments. If not, again, that is totally fine. Um, if you want to keep it to yourself and use it as something to reflect back on from the beginning to the end of the webinar. Okay, and I'm going to give folks a few minutes to read through those if you like. Okay, before we get started here with um, our presenters, we do have, um, I think it's three students lined up to present here. Um, I'm asking that as students are presenting, please do not add anything to the chat. Um, we like to keep our questions for the very end. Um, and this is just time to be like fully listening uh, to what is happening. Please feel free to take notes if you wish to do so. Um, and if you have anything that that we do need to hear about, um, please feel free to private message myself or Derek. And with that, I will go ahead and pass it off to Abigail here. There we go. Okay, thank you, Annie. First, I'm just going to start by going over some basic definitions. So for patriarchy, that's basically just the system where men have more power than women and it is a system built by men to oppress and control women. And this affects everyone, and it's really important that we realize it doesn't just impact women, but everyone in our society. Next slide, please. Okay, so there's also a lot of inequality within the patriarchy, and that's super important to acknowledge. For example, um, the patriarchy gives men power, but it doesn't give all men the same amount of power. This is usually um, financial and political and like representation wise. Um, BIPOC men and LGBTQIA QIA plus men, sorry, um, usually do not benefit as much from the patriarchy as white men do because um, the patriarchy is a system built by straight white men for themselves. And this is also a very similar case for women. Women all aren't equally oppressed under the patriarchy. Um, BIPOC and LGBTQIA plus women are um, more oppressed under society's standards than white women and 
other types of um, women. But it's really just important to realize that all these additional factors like racism, homophobia, transphobia, all play into the patriarchy and interconnect and intertwine. And um, yeah, it's just very important to realize that that um, even if you are affected in a negative way by the patriarchy, there are still other ways for you to be privileged. For example, um, in the workplace, even though white women are still affected negatively by the patriarchy, they are still more likely to be taken seriously and given better opportunities than a black woman. And that is due to just like white supremacy and racism that are intertwined with the patriarchy. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, and now I'm just gonna go over some things about heteronormativity, which is also a big part of the patriarchy. So if you don't know, heteronormativity is just um, the effect based on the belief that heterosexuality is the only normal sexual orientation, which is obviously not true. And um, this started a long time ago, hundreds of years, when gender inequality was like very, very bad. Um, and it was created by the combination of gender inequality and the enforcement of heterosexuality to create heteronormativity. And this is basically just the idea that women were weak and submissive and therefore they needed a man who was thought of as strong and dominant to protect them that they had to marry and just do everything they could to make his life easier and serve him. And this helped to rationalize the power that men had over women and give them like an excuse to participate in this patriarchal behavior, which is helping to create this heteronormativity. And also um, I should mention that at the time LGBTQIA plus marriage was basically all outlawed and very taboo in the society. And this was also just a huge um, role in creating heteronormativity. Okay, next slide, please. Um, and then lastly, I'm just going to talk about what the patriarchy has been like recently. So a lot of us have heard probably the term girl boss on social media, which is really just like a harmless joke when you think about it, but it can be used in negative ways. Um, for example, just like many young feminists are tokenized by the term girl boss and it's used to make fun of them and discredit their valid opinions about the patriarchy and all things that have to do with the feminist movement. And it's mostly like adults and anti-feminists that are attacking these younger people for wanting to make change by just discrediting their opinions and everything that they stand for. So that's really not okay. And also we need to recognize that patriarchy is a framework that is built into our society and it's intertwined with so many forms of discrimination and everything is all interconnected. And that's why it must be dismantled. Okay, now I am just gonna pass it back to Annie for a story time section. Thank you, Abigail. Um... So we did put in a story time section for, uh, for this webinar because we thought that it would be um, a good experience for all of us to listen to each other, the participants here, and um, to listen to our stories of how the patriarchy has affected us individually. Um, I know that it is challenging to have a story that shows um, blatantly how you are affected in those ways, but we do invite people to share. Um, and please, when people are sharing, uh, try to keep comments again to a minimum unless they are encouraging. Um, please uh, refrain from questioning someone's story and taking away the validity of that story, and I'm sure you can all agree with that point. So at this time, I'm going to welcome anyone who wants to share to um, raise their hand, use the raise hand feature, or physically raise their hand like so. Um, Derek will be creating a stack in the chat here that um, will allow folks to share in a given order. Um, and I can also wait a few minutes if 
people need a little bit of time to think about what they might share. Uh, we did put aside 10 minutes for the section, 10 to 15. Um, if it doesn't take as much time as it is given, that is totally fine and we can go ahead and move on. Um, and if it needs more time, we're also happy to allow more time for this section. And I'm also welcoming any questions if folks are confused about the prompt um, or what they might want to share. Yes, I can restate the prompt. Um, so if there if you can remember a time or uh, an example of how you have found the patriarchy to affect you personally um, or your community or um, affect you in a way uh, where you were able to realize your own privilege in society or um, if you were able to see how others are oppressed in society in comparison to yourself or others. And I see a lot of people are raising their hands now, so that is great. Uh, but yeah, thank you also for creating a safe space for folks to share. That is very crucial um, in these public settings and you all executed that beautifully. Okay, Tevrin, I'm gonna pass it to you. Okay, so feminism. Um, feminism put very simply and broadly is the belief that all people are equal regardless of gender and should be treated as such. Because of systematic and personal biases or, or oppression, um, especially the patriarchy and transphobia when we're talking about gender, although, as mentioned before, all systems of oppression are connected and intertwined. Um, people of all genders are not treated equally. Feminism puts a particular emphasis on rights for women, although it is important to acknowledge that all genders besides men are oppressed by the patriarchy and this interconnecting systems and should be included as feminism. And men are also affected by the patriarchy. Um, in the next few slides, I'm going to give a brief overview of the history of feminism using the organizing system of waves that is commonly used when discussing the history of feminism. Uh, um, however, I recognize that this is not a perfect metaphor. Um, also, it will focus on the history of feminism in the United States of America um, and other countries may have similar and different histories of the subject. Uh, the first, okay, next slide. <laughs> um, the first wave of feminism took place during the 19th and early 20th centuries. It focused on getting basic legal rights for women, especially the right to vote, which resulted in the 19th Amendment. Um, the movement did exclude Black women and other women of color. Black women felt like they had to choose between a feminist movement for white women and a Black movement for Black men. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the second wave of feminism took place in the 1960s through the 1980s. It focused on freeing women from being forced into primarily domestic roles, um, both by trying to remove stereotypes, which was obviously only semi-successful because 
those stereotypes still haunt women today and by legally giving them more freedom. Women in this wave got a lot of legislation pivotal for women's rights passed. Um, issues of violence against women and reproductive rights were brought to the forefront of the movement. Um, however, a lot of trans exclusionary feminist ideas were developed during this wave, mainly because of the strong idea that um, like the woman and connected with like the woman's body um, where not all women have the same kind of body. Um, and those ideas still carry on with some people today. Most women in this wave saw some interconnections between gender and race. However, most of the prominent figures um, were white women and women of color were mostly ignored by the movement despite their, participa their participation in the movement and the role and their role in the general mindset. Um, next slide, please. The third wave took place from 1991 to around 2012. It focused on gender, race, and reproductive rights. In this wave, transgender people became more or somewhat more visible to feminists. So despite the focus on um, reproductive rights, there were not as many new toxic ideas forming about trans people. However, there was plenty of transphobia that carried throughout the wave um, and still carries through to the current day. Um, there was some amount of acknowledgement of past exclusivity in feminism and some emergence of intersectional feminism, which I'll talk more about on the next slide. Feminism also started to appear more in pop culture during this wave with things like the Riot Girl movement. Next slide. Um, the fourth wave of feminism is taking place from around 2012 to present day. It is not widely grieved agreed what wave of feminism we are currently in, with some people people saying that we are still in the third wave and others saying that the fifth wave has begun. I'm going off the idea that there are four waves in current feminism in this presentation. Um, however, that's not set in stone in my mind. Um, one thing that seems to distinguish this wave from the third is the online focus. Feminists can use online platforms to share stories and spread hashtags, as well as educating a large audience that they might not otherwise have. There seems to be a focus on sexual harassment in this wave as well. Another large part of this wave is intersectional feminism. Intersectional feminism has been building up for waves before this, especially the third. However, it has come into greater light in this one. The next part of, in the next part of this uh, webinar, Maddie will go further into what intersectionality is. But for a very quick explanation of what intersectional feminism is, it's a way of looking at feminism that incorporates all the different experiences of people. For example, looking at the experiences of a Black woman, we see the inequity they face not only as a woman, but as a Black person. We see that their experiences overlap. Um, intersectional feminism also requires the acknowledgement of past exclusivity in feminism, as we're doing in this um, part of the webinar. So um, next slide, please. So feminism is obviously very connected to the patriarchy seeing that patriarchy is a system that upholds discrimination based upon gender. Um, it also upholds other forms of discrimination. And feminism is a movement that actively seeks to remove those barriers and other barriers. Um, so now you're probably wondering who can be a feminist and how can I become one? Um, and anyone can be a feminist, although it is a misconception that only women can be feminists, as simply not true. And actually, the thought that men can't be feminists is mostly toxic masculinity. Um, which, by the way, if you don't know what that means, I'm pretty sure Maddie has a quick definition of it later on. Um, if you believe in equity regardless, 
of equality and equity, regardless of gender, then you're probably a feminist. Although being a feminist should not necessarily stop at your beliefs. Um, as a feminist, you should take action to do work to make those beliefs reality. Um, next slide. So here are some actions that you can take to educate yourself and in general feminism. <laughs> um, note that there will be some calls to action at the end of this webinar. Um, these are more of recommendations of things that you can do to continue or start your work as a feminist. A great thing to begin with is educating yourself, which by the way, you've already begun to do by attending this webinar and hopefully the next in the series. But um, you should continue to educate yourself by reading books, articles, watching documentaries, etc. Another thing you can do is go to marches um, when it's safe for you. Although it has been a pandemic, when it's safe, it is great to go to um, women's protests and marches. A really important thing you can do to raise and listen to the voices of those who are oppressed uh, is to raise and listen to the voices of those who are oppressed by the patriarchy. A kind of example of this is listening to the stories of uh, these people who are oppressed by the patriarchy, which we, and just in general affected by it, which we did a little bit ago um, with the story time activity. Um, but continue to listen to what these people have to say look out for that online. Again, as I said earlier, feminists can use online platforms to share stories. Um, but continue to listen to what these people have to say and make sure to support them when they speak out or share their experiences with you. If you, if you are someone who has something to share about how you've been affected by the patriarchy, then you might also consider speaking out. Again, as some of you did at the story time. Um, you can also support female and feminist artists, um, listen to their music, read their books, look at their art, watch their videos. This is also a great way of raising and listening to these voices and a good way to educate yourself. And now I'm going to pass it off to Maddie to talk about, who will talk about intersectionality. Thank you, Tevrin. So I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into intersectionality in this section. And uh, so when we're talking about intersectionality and intersectional feminism specifically, it's really, really important to recognize that systems of power and oppression do not operate independently and separately from one another. Um, it's really crucial that we acknowledge this intersectionality in order to truly understand the patriarchy and take steps toward dismantling it. Centering the voices of people whose social identities overlap to create compounding experiences of discrimination is another important aspect of intersectional feminism. For too long, as Tevin mentioned, the feminist movement has included women of color and members of other marginalized communities. This needs to change for progress to be made. And before we move forward, we're going to do another super quick personal reflection. It's only gonna be about a minute. And this time we're actually just going to have you either think through your ideas yourself or just write them down on paper, but we are not going to be sharing out at this time. Although I hope that as we continue through this section, you'll be able to kind of revise and add to these ideas as you gain more knowledge. So the prompt is, uh, how does patriarchy disproportionately impact certain groups of people? Now we're just going to take about a minute on this and uh, we will move on shortly.
Okay, so we are going to be moving on, but if you need a little bit more time, you can just continue to sort of reflect and think about this as we continue throughout the rest of the section. Uh, next slide. Okay, so the first topic we're going to cover is patriarchy and how it relates to racial discrimination. Now, as Abigail discussed, not all men are granted equal power under the patriarchy, just as not all women share the same experiences of gender bias and misogyny. Massage noir is a term coined by the black queer feminist Moya Bailey in 2010, and it refers to a specific type of misogyny experienced by black women that is rooted in racism and anti-blackness. In our patriarchal society, women are conditioned to conform to a certain stereotype or role within society. However, the black, black women face different stereotyping and societal pressures than white women do. They tend to be viewed as loud, angry, or threatening when speaking up for themselves and are often perceived as hypersexual for no, for no reason. Uh, healthcare disparities uh, are another serious issue that uh, black women face. Racism, discrimination, and unconscious bias continue to plague the US healthcare system and cause unequal treatment for racial and ethnic minorities. This is particularly relevant to black women during pregnancy and delivery. Many have attributed the fact that black women have nearly three times the infant mortality rate to healthcare disparities based on their race. Sorry about that. Um, workplace discrimination is another characteristic of, or another example of massage noir. Uh, and this includes the fact that protective hairstyles worn by black women are often considered unprofessional and black people, not exclusively black women, must often code switch in the workplace in order to receive fair treatment and equal opportunities. And just to clarify, code switching essentially involves uh, adjusting one's style of speech, appearance, behavior, and expression in, other, in order to make others uh, more comfortable. And those other people are the non-black people who tend to be in charge in the workplace. Uh, racial gaslighting is another huge uh, characteristic of massage noir and a serious issue. It's a form of psychological manipulation that makes people of color question their own experiences of racism. The experiences of black women often go overlooked, unnoticed and untold specifically in cases of police violence and sexual assault. The validity and truth of their stories is often questioned and he heavily scrutinized, which only worsens the trauma. Uh, systemic oppression dating back to colonization and slavery can be identified as the root cause for most of these issues. During slavery, black women were completely denied autonomy over their reproduction and sexuality. White slave owners were in complete control and a black woman's worth was essentially reduced to her reproductive capabilities, which led to the sexualization and fetishization of black women that we still see today. Women of color also occupy over half of all jobs in the domestic service industry in the US here today. This is also a result of colonization and slavery because historically women of color worked almost exclusively to serve white families. Uh, next slide. So the wage gap can also be attributed to systemic oppression. And although women in general do make less than men in general, this disparity is much greater for women of color. Uh, According to 2021 data from Payscale, women make 82 cents for every $1 made by white men. As I said before, this gap is much more severe for women of color. Asian women make 95 cents per dollar made by white men. Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander women make only 76 cents. Uh, American Indian and Alaska Native women make only 69 cents. White women make 82 cents. Hispanic women make only 76 cents cents and black black or African American women make only 77 cents per dollar made by white by white men and that really really starts to add up to create huge issues that lead to uh, basically poverty and other financial struggles uh, next slide so the next topic I'm going to cover is patriarchy and how it impacts the LGBTQIA plus community uh, the first sort of point that is really important to be discussing is gender roles. So femininity and masculinity were associated with gender in the establishment of the patriarchy. Living in a patriarchal society, we've been conditioned to associate masculine traits with men and feminine traits with women, which is simply not true. These gender roles are centered around male dominance and people who do not conform to gender roles dictated by the patriarchy often face discrimination. 
Now, when discussing the experiences of transgender people under the patriarchy, it's important to understand that a person's experiences and roles within a patriarchal society are based more so on societal perception than on their own personal identity. Because of this, transgender men who are perceived as men by society can experience male privilege. However, they can also experience misdirected misogyny by those who do not accept their gender identity. It's important to note that this is misdirected because by definition, misogyny is prejudice against women and transgender men are not women. However, it is still an issue that they face. Transgender women, on the other hand, rarely experience male privilege, even from people who do not accept their gender identity because of the intersectionality between sexism and discrimination on the basis of gender identity. The discrimination that a trans woman faces for being trans essentially negates that privilege that she may have been granted from being perceived as a man. And trans women who are perceived as women, correctly perceived as women by society, do experience misogyny, which is why it's so, so crucial to include them in the feminist movement. Now, the experiences of non-binary people in a patriarchal society are very unique because the patriarchy operates under the assumption that gender is binary. So therefore the usage of pronouns, any pronouns other than she, her, and he, him contradicts patriarchal ideals. Therefore people who are perceived as androgynous by society don't really fit into patriarchal gender roles because those roles are catered to men and women. However, similar to transgender people, Non-binary folks who are perceived incorrectly perceived as men by society may experience male privilege, and those who are incorrectly perceived as women by society may experience misdirected misogyny despite not being women. Uh, it's a little confusing, and it's something that we all need to, but it's something that we all need to sort of understand in order to solve this issue. Uh, next slide. Okay, so lastly, I'm going to discuss patriarchy and its impact on climate. Male privilege is one of the major factors that is holding us back when it comes to mitigating the effects of the climate crisis. Uh, people who are in a position of privilege, such as cisgender, heterosexual white men, tend to be less likely to take climate action because they are not facing the direct impacts. The issue here is that privileged people, these cisgender, heterosexual white men, are the ones making decisions regarding the climate crisis. This needs to change. I've said this over and over again, as well as many other USL members throughout this webinar, but that is why it's so crucial that we center the voices of those most impacted by the climate crisis and other social justice issues when making decisions. Toxic masculinity is another factor uh, that is kind of preventing us from taking climate action. Uh, toxic masculinity, which is a product of the patriarchy, causes many men to regard traditionally feminine traits as inferior or weak. Eco-friendly behaviors have been associated with femininity. Therefore, those behaviors and actions are less likely to be taken by men who are insecure in their own masculinity. This could be as simple as bringing a reusable bag to the grocery store, or as large as refusing to make a policy change that's intended to combat the climate crisis. And that is why in order to save the planet, we need to smash the patriarchy. And with that, I will pass it to Annie. Thank you, Maddie. Um, I'm now going to go into the closing here before our Q&A. First of all, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, as many of you know, we will be having two more webinars in the Patriarchy webinar series. Um, the next one will be next week on Monday the 26th um, at the same time from 4 to 5.30. That webinar will be going into rape culture and um, then also a segment on dress code. We will have students presenting for about the first 15 minutes of that webinar, and then we will have an amazing guest speaker come in and do a presentation that goes more in depth and relates those two topics to the patriarchy. Um, in addition, we have a few calls to action. Please promote the webinar series to your friends and family. Uh, coming out, and Derek, if you could please paste in the chat the registration to the next webinar, that would be great. Um, we, you know, have a certain bandwidth when it comes to who we can reach out here, and uh, we do have um, quite the email list, but it is still so helpful if you all can spread the word. Um, and then share what you've learned with the people around you. If there's something that stuck with you, uh, please make sure to share it with others, whether it's in a public space, um, at work, or with your family members, and please hold each other accountable. Okay, um, moving forward, 
uh, we are going to go into a Q&A session. Um, and for the first two minutes of this, we would like to invite you all to sit with us um, and listen to some bird sounds and just kind of think about and reflect on the past presentation and some questions that you may have for students. We will be going ahead and using the, um, the stack again. So if you do have a question, you're welcome to put it in the chat um, or raise your hand. And we will go ahead and put that stack together. And then I will allow all of the students who wish to, to speak to that question. Um, in addition, I would like to acknowledge that all of us here are on this journey with you. This is, um, I think, one of the first times that USL has really looked into the integral parts of the patriarchy. And so um, thank you for allowing us to continue learning uh, with you. And um, we're hoping to do that in our next webinars as well. So please remember to register for those um, and to spread the word. Okay, Derek, I'm going to hand it over to you for the bird sounds. Um, and please feel free to reflect for the next two minutes. And I'll see you all then. Okay, thank you everyone for sitting with us. Um, we will now begin our Q&A, but I would first like to promote a fundraiser that USL um, is officially starting today. Uh, as you all know, um, we were able to do a lot this year, um, thanks to the support from the community and with the help of past fundraisers as well. Um, so we'll be hosting a fundraiser from now until August 31st in preparation for the 2021 to 2022 school year. Uh, if you are interested in donating, I think that Derek, if you could put that in the chat, that would be great. Um, you are all also the first to hear about this. We have not sent out an email yet, so that will be coming shortly um, if you'd like to hold off until then. But I thought that we would go ahead and share that as well. Okay, I'm now going to open up the Q&A. So if anyone has questions, I think we can go ahead and get a stack going.
Okay, Maggie, do you have a question? <laughs> yeah, it's sort of a question and a comment. Um, first of all, thank you so much. I uh, thank all of you USL students for presenting um, and putting together this webinar. It's so cool to see it kind of from the outside um, since I'm usually involved, but this was amazing and very in-depth. Um, and I'm so happy to see uh, what you all put together. Uh, my other question is uh, where can uh, youth members who are here um, and maybe haven't been to a USL meeting before or want to join USL, when, where can they uh, reach out to join or see if they're interested in joining USL? Um, I think that uh, for students who are here, um, if you have us on Instagram, it's USL. Let me double check it real quick. Um, if you have us on Instagram, then you're welcome to contact us that way. We also do have an email um, that we can use and I'll, I'll paste those in the chat as well. So I'll make sure to get to that. Um, and you know, you're also welcome to reach out to myself or Maggie uh, or any other students you see here who have USL in their bios. Um, and we'll be happy to answer any questions. We usually like to meet with students uh, separately before they join a larger meeting, just so that they kind of know what they're getting themselves into. We've heard that joining the USL meeting right off the bat is very overwhelming. So we try to um, make sure that students are not feeling that when it's unnecessary. Uh, and you know, any form of participation is welcome. You don't, we don't really have a requirement for uh, how many meetings you have to go to as long as you're keeping up to date and making sure um, that you know you're comfortable with what you're doing that is all that we ask and um yeah so i hope that that answered any questions and i will make sure to add those to the chat as well do any other students from usl have any suggestions for possible incoming students i would just like to say that something i really really like about usl that's benefit from being student run is that you don't, there's no capacity requirement. So if you need to like take a step back because you have a hard class or you're doing something else, or you just need a break from this, we everyone totally understands and everyone else steps up and it all works out. So I think that's something really cool about USA. Yeah, thanks Jackson. Um, anyone else or are we, I think that pretty much covered it. We're good, okay. Uh, Preston, I'll go ahead and pass it to you. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm so like grateful that y'all are doing this. I feel like this is the kind of like background information I didn't really get until I was in college. Um, and I feel like, you know, whether it's extracurricularly or, um, you know, maybe even like part of like mandatory conversations in something like health class, right? Because like, if you think about health class, that's also directly through the lens of the patriarchy. Um, and I feel like a lot of the pushback about maybe like the way that, you know, we want like uh, following the, like the referendum change to the, to the sexual education curriculum. Like, I feel like that that's directly a manifestation of the patriarchy in a lot of ways. So I'm, I'm just super grateful that y'all are doing this. Um, and I, I, my question is about um, the ways in which you see um, class as also being an intersection so um like wealth discrepancy and income inequality um in some ways also maybe being um an integral part of the like the both the consequences of the patriarchy and integral to upholding it um uh i loved all the intersections that you guys talked about but i feel like class is a really important one to me as well so i was wondering if you wanted to talk about that at all yeah um Thank you for bringing that up. I think that you're absolutely right. Um, class is definitely in there. Uh, I personally um, am not a great spokesperson for that, uh, but if there are other students who possibly have more knowledge and would like to share, that would be great. I'm happy to give it a go though. Um, or, you know, even just scheduling a time to talk about it with you, Preston, also, we're happy to do that, because I think that, you know, just continuing this discussion into future meetings and future actions is also really important, um, and continuing to, like, broaden our scope of intersectionality and looking at uh, 
all the different reaches um, for that. So unless students have anything, I'd love to just, oh, Eva, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Um, so like one way that I think class like intersects with feminism is a lot of times like we kind of recognize that women have power once they have a lot of like wealth or like capital or whatever. And like, I don't know, that's that's an example of, you know, class and feminism. Yeah, I think as the person who was kind of in charge of the section on intersectionality, that's definitely something that I should have incorporated a little bit more into uh, my segment. There was just a lot to cover and a lot. This could be hours and hours and hours worth of material here. Um, I definitely think that touching on like the wage gap again as well, like how how much more difficult it is, especially like for women, single mothers, or just uh, financially independent women to be successful with that, like wage disparities uh, is definitely something that comes to mind first. But again, we'd have to, I'd have to do a little more research and have a little more in-depth discussion on that to fully cover everything. Yeah, um, thank you for that question. I really appreciate how that um, provoked some, some future discussions as well. Um, it looks like next on the stack is Kamal, so go for it. Yeah, uh, thanks for today. Uh, I learned a lot. I had a, a few ahas. Um, one was uh, the word, the phrase compounding um, discrimination. I just, I never heard that before, so I really appreciate it. And it, you know, it's used in finance all the time. That's interesting to see it in a social perspective. Um, the other aha I had, and I have a question around it, is um, you were talking about uh, smash the patriarchy, save the planet concept. Um, and it was interesting that uh, men might see like, you know, uh, eco-friendliness as being like, uh, you know, femi feminist and like they're not secure in their own selves because of that. Um, I just thought that that line of thinking was really interesting and curious how you guys are leveraging that and where that connects to maybe uh, your work in general. That's a great question. Um, is Maddie, did you want to go into that? Uh, I can if, if that's okay with everyone. Yeah, go for it. Um, I think that definitely the work we're doing here with educating people, um, I mean, the patriarchy is just is this system that's been ingrained in all of us, this toxic masculinity, it may not be something that people are even realizing. So this type of education is going to help sort of uh, take down those biases and preconceptions about how uh, certain things are innately feminine or masculine because uh, and I think that will be very helpful in getting more men involved in uh, climate action. And I actually have quite a few articles that I could, uh, I don't have them on hand right now that I reference for this, uh, that kind of discussed multiple studies that have been done uh, that had to do with like, or uh, climate use more masculine logos tended to be, uh, uh, receive more participation from men and things like that. So I think just the work we're doing here is helpful in that sense. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, are there any other students who would like to add? That was a great explanation though, Maddie. Yeah, Maggie. Yeah, one of the things that we discuss within USL or have discussed a couple times is that uh, we're disproportionately getting more women or girls joining USL than we are getting uh, men. And I think it's definitely something to recognize, like even from just the very beginning of climate activism, that uh, it might be how patriarchy interacts with human beings, right? If you're a woman um, and you have seen these to kind of forms of oppression if you have been in a situation uh, where you feel like your voice hasn't been listened to 
um, you might be seeking out a place to have your voice heard and um, finding places where you can have that support and have that connection um, like USL and like Social Justice Club, which Annie and I both um, co uh, are co-presidents of at South would be. Um, and if you're less affected by the patriarchy and you're more comfortable um, or less challenged within society, then you're less likely to speak out or less likely to start um, pushing for things to change. So that's something to think about, um, just recognizing like what uh, kind of pushes people to start speaking out and getting involved and start um, expressing that they're not comfortable with the society that they're living in currently. So something to think about. Yeah, thanks for that, Maggie. Um, I would also add that you see in a lot of uh, climate legislation that's being passed, um, at least more recently from, we have personal experience with this, but also uh, on the state level as well. Um, we've seen Governor Jay Inslee um, veto sections of uh, climate legislation that include um, how indigenous people are affected by the climate and um, how their actions of standing up against fossil fuel industry have really um, helped Washington to uh, not have as much industry as it does. And so by failing to recognize that and choosing not to recognize it, you are continuing to uphold the patriarchy and to also have someone um, such as Jay Inslee, who is uh, a white man in power, be making those decisions that um, inevitably do not affect him directly whatsoever is um, I think you know very upsetting and something that we have to look at, especially um, with older white environmentalists. That seems to be a common thread. Um, we did experience that same thing with uh, Langley City Council when we were trying to pass our own climate emergency declaration, and uh, there were a few people on the council who were very uncomfortable with the words rape culture that we included in the section to talk about how indigenous women specifically are disproportionately affected by the fossil fuel industry and how it allows um, man camps in, uh, in tribal areas and allows the men to kind of take over um, those communities and um, which is adding to the murdered and missing indigenous women. So it really is all connected and um, you have to be able to at least have a form of empathy for people around you and to be able to see the intersectionality to be able to make those kinds of decisions. And it's really disappointing when people fail to recognize that. Um, so yeah, I think it's a common, a common scene for environmentalists and activists and kind of that battle um, between like this very extreme scientific piece of it and the social justice aspects and you can't have one over the other, it takes both to combat the climate crisis. And I will pass it to Momo. I think you are next on the stack. Thank you. Um, yeah, first, just thank you so much. This is my first USL uh, webinar or meeting, and it feels really great to be um, having this work happening and um, be able to access it locally. Um, the articulation and clarity of the presentation was really wonderful and I learned a lot, so thank you. Um, I would like to know if this presentation is available to be watched again, because I see that it is being recorded. So that's one question. And the other question is related to, you mentioned something about like contact us by email and I'm not sure since this is my first time um, what that means either. So. That's my questions are more logistic at this point, thanks. Yeah, um, thank you for those questions. It's always good to reiterate that for everyone here. Um, so yes, we are recording the meeting and uh, the meeting recording will eventually be posted on our YouTube. Uh, I think that we are going to take out the story time because that was a very personal section and um, we know that, you know, it's not great to be posting things that are very personal on the internet, especially when we don't have folks direct approval. Um, so please do not worry about that. As far as the email, um, Maggie just put our email in the chat, mnatris at uslwoodbe.org. Um, and you by 
uh, using the email, you'll either reach Maggie or myself, uh, depending on who is responding. Um, and then it, once you register for a webinar, so for this webinar, uh, you are now automatically on our emailing list. So all of you uh, should start to receive um, our weekly emails. And Derek, if I could get a confirmation on that. Okay, awesome. That's, um, that's how it goes. So if you choose to not get our weekly emails anymore, you can unsubscribe um, if you wish to do so. And yeah, I hope that that answers your question. Okay, awesome. Um, it looks like we have Shelly next on the stack. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, and just ditto on the kudos. Um, you guys are doing an amazing job and this was very impressive. Um, and I just really appreciate your insightfulness as well. Um, my question is around, do you students feel comfortable like when you find a really good article or a webinar or a YouTube video or a book or whatever it might be, a speaker, um, do you feel comfortable going to your teachers and, or maybe the administration and sharing that and saying, hey, I think this would be good to, you know, include in class? Just, just curious if that's something that you guys do. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think I can speak for myself and then I'll pass it off to other students who have something to add. But um, with the with the discussion around curriculum change that has really um, been promoted a lot last year, I think that in the future students will be more likely to come to those to come to at least certain teachers with concerns that they have about the curriculum, or um, to you know try to include something else that will really help to benefit everyone in the class. So I'm I'm seeing the discussions start to happen, and I'm seeing. Uh, I'm seeing that to be a very like a real possibility in the future where um, teachers and students can um, be working together to benefit the education of the students and um, the school environment. And so I'm very hopeful for that. Um, and I'm also really excited because I think that after you know that conversation is started, it's only a matter of time before more students are able to catch on to that idea of collaboration and um, standing up for your education and sharing your voice. So yeah, and if there are any other students who'd like to add, Abigail? Yeah, um, we might not be doing that like collectively as USL, but I do know a lot of students that have been recommending books and articles to their teachers. I myself have been doing that more specifically like this year because I've just been reading a lot of new material and a lot of things that I find really interesting that I feel very comfortable recommending to my teachers so they can share it. Yeah, would anyone else like to share or maybe just a thumbs up if you're ready? If not, please share it. I see Jackson. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so I think um, for me, the online format has been kind of harder to like directly interact like that. I have recommended a couple books to this, to the, some, to one teacher in particular. Um, and the school did send out an email, I'm not sure if everyone like saw it, like requesting books for their library. And I requested a lot of representation books for the library that they did get and I saw there. So I think the school's way more open now to that. Yeah, I definitely agree. And um, also just really quick, I have just realized it's four minutes, minutes past time. So if you do have to leave, please feel free to leave. Um, we really appreciate all of your questions and all of your support throughout this webinar. I think we do have one more question from Gary. Um, and then, you know, we're all probably gonna hop off, but if you need to leave now, please feel free to do so. And we greatly appreciate all of your support. Well, I'll begin my question with a comment. Uh, first of all, how humbled, awed, and uh, generally impressed by that I am by you all. And uh, I gotta mention your mentor in that as well. Having been raised in uh, as a dominator in the patriarchy, as I mentioned earlier, 
but uh, marrying a feminist was really instrumental in changing my uh, worldview. Um, and during this period of reflection we had, I was reminded of a film uh, about Helen Reddy, uh, who uh, wrote the song that really galvanized the movement in the 80s. And uh, I was wondering how many of you young people were familiar with I Am Woman. The name sounds familiar to me, but I, I can't say um, that I'm super familiar. Uh, are any other students? No. Okay, Gary, would you like to explain a little bit more or elaborate or you're also welcome to put a link in the chat because we're always happy to look at things as well. I put a link in the chat to the movie. Okay. Um, which tells the, the backstory to the uh, song. She was an Australian woman married uh, to an Australian man who turned out to be her uh, manager. She had a goal of being a rock star. And uh, it really tells a story of misogyny uh, within their relationship. But when she finally uh, was inspired to uh, promote and uh, release this film, it rocked the world. If you Google it, if you do nothing more than just Google the song, uh, that'll be enough. But if you check out the film, it's on Netflix. And I put it in the Helen Reddy. And uh, my wife just showed up. She's my mentor in all things fem feminist. I need to do it. And she'll reinforce, uh, she reinforces just what a powerful film it is. And uh, how how powerful the the song was it just uh galvanized everyone how many of uh, us older folks remember that's tracy chapman <laughs> love her too but that's kind of yeah no it looks like Clyde. thank you you put the youtube um the song and lyrics in the chat so thanks for doing that and thank you gary for sharing we'll make sure to take a look and um yeah i appreciate the recommendation okay i think that concludes our q a um if anything has anything if anyone has anything to add um or you know if a discussion would be had after or at a later date please let us know we are always happy to take in um take in any feedback or you know just to talk with community that's one of our favorite things as well so please let us know if there's anything and we'll be happy to meet with you